Well, hello. Um, this is over your 10th week discussion, the first part of uh, the Pfeiffer book, and God grew tired of us <clears throat> for 800, 804 class. And I appreciate um, the level of, of response, emotional response to the to the book. I mean, it's an easy read. That's why I like it. And, it, you know, it's not about English. I mean, it's not about culture so much in our culture. I mean, they are in our culture, but it's it's refugees in particular here. People that are admitted to the United States because of traumatic events. Now, some of that's been cut off now, as you know, uh, people refusing to admit them. But um, I just want to hit some highlights here. Kimberly, one thing I liked is she talked about how would you get this lesson across to our students, what it's like to be uh, like one of the lost boys and said, uh, I believe we could go without electronics and work to the best of our abilities without electricity in the classroom. Students should be required to write on, be right on the backs of used paper and to share books during reading. Lunch would include a meal similar to what the lost boys would eat in Sudan, something simple, in order to experience the difference in diet and how difficult it is to adapt. If possible, I'd have a guest speaker who taught the lesson in very broken English so that my students could experience difficulty in communication. Some students might not be able to sit at a table with chairs. Others might have sat on the floor. In other words, the idea of doing a little exercise in your class where you live like they did in that camp. Very, very interesting idea. The food, the whole experience. It might even be interesting to have someone talk to them in their language, a language which your students don't understand. Um, of course, you'd want a dynamic speaker, so it'd be some understanding with some manipulatives or passing around food and talking about it. But that could be done, especially in Spanish, because that was a language that they may know a little bit about. Um, that was one that impressed me. Um, The treatment of those um, Kurdish sisters, uh, well, obviously some of this you can't share with elementary, but the fact people would be fed rice with glass in it so that people would bleed internally and die. I mean, horrible torture. So disgusting. Um, Obviously, most of you reacted strongly to the sisters. Um, I had written down some things about them, mainly about their, that they represent sisters of different ages. Um, I know, and I had my notes, and I didn't bring them right with me. I was going to use on this video, but I know there's sister that's, a uh, couple of younger sisters adapt very readily to being in Lincoln, Nebraska, and some of the others are more isolated. Um, some of them take over as kind of a co-mother with the mother. And, and the mother of the Curtis sister, she's, she's the one that I think that when you do, the, you, even if you go back in your own family, you find that the oldest generation or the parents that immigrated to the United States or the oldest brother and sister along with them, they, they had the hardest adjustment and they missed their, they were homesick. They didn't embrace the new home. And, Think of it like this, everything you know would have been in about the place that's no longer here. They left Sweden or Denmark or Germany or Poland or wherever, Italy, and they came to the United States and they still mentally, everything they know is still back home. And what they have here is confusion and a lot of them don't adapt well and suffer terribly because of it, but that's their sacrifice so that the other generation can uh, be successful. Now, something important about this, I want you to think about how important it is to document this experience for your students. 
if you're in a high school and you can have someone interview their father, grandfather, whoever made this trip over recently, can imagine if you could go back and talk to your great grandfather and have an interview. This would be amazing. You might need a translator, but you may need one for your students. But there's no reason why they couldn't do an interview on video and then do it in Spanish and then have it translated later. You know, put the subtitles at the bottom. Think of what a historic document that would be to capture that in time, what was really going on, what they were thinking, at least some of it might be pretty rough. Um, I know a lot of you talked about what you'd do if you could be Mary Pfeiffer and take part in her, you know, helping. And you realize, of course, she must have had a lot of time that she made. I don't know how much time she had free, but she made the time. Because once you get involved with a family like this, it absorbs you. Um, you can't just pull back and say, no, I'm not around this weekend, or I'm going to be busy for a couple of weeks, don't bother me. Because once you make the commitment, then that'll be seen as breaking your friendship, your obligation to them. So that's something to be concerned about if you get involved. You can't just be a little involved. You can't say, no, my husband doesn't want you around my house, or no, you can't, you know, she let him borrow a car. That's pretty extreme, you know. I'd be worried about liability. Um, also, um, you know, Taylor, you mentioned in here, the sisters asked, what does sarcasm mean? Ta Taylor Hand, I think we got two Taylors. But uh, t um, sarcasm is a very American and very English type humor. And it really doesn't work well uh, because people take you at your very straightforward. So sarcasm uh, can be seen as making fun of them, even if you don't mean it that way. So I always say, you know, the smart aleck kid in the room usually gets reprimanded, although he may be very funny, and I love sarcasm. But I know when I deal with English second language learners, I'm pretty straightforward about things. Um, or else I explain my jokes in a very so they're very simple and directly funny. Um, you mentioned also, Taylor, about letting kids share their, their, uh, their story with you. And uh, there's so much they need to get out. And generally speaking, unless there's trauma, they, you should be able to handle that in a classroom. You know, somebody where something horrible happened to them, then that's different. I've, I have known several high school students from the Sudan, uh, from Liberia, and from Somalia. And I remember the one from Liberia, they had a civil war, and he talked about his... Uh, well, gosh, um, his brother and father being killed before him. And then a guy took a gun stock and smashed his mouth, breaking all his teeth. And he still has to go to the dentist, get his teeth worked on because he had to have false teeth because they were destroyed. And he was only probably 17, 20 years old, something like that. Um, and also people would, cut off the arms or fingers or the nose of children to let people know how vicious they were. So when you'd see somebody who'd been, been tormented like that. And so that's kind of stuff happened. And I know in Af parts of Africa, in Liberia especially, it was just unbelievable. Liberia, by the way, was a founded as a colony of African Americans who went back to be, go back to Africa. That was the old send them back to Africa thing back in the 1830s. And some people wanted to go back because they had a historical memory. But um, the fact is that it was formed as a democratic republic, kind of like the United States even has an American-like flag. But Liberia had a terrible war, and it's just unbelievable stuff that's gone. Ears cut off, 
Uh, now I'm not talking just adults either. Um, Lisa, you mentioned the, um, the Bosnian family. And when they came over here, all their skills, the guy was working some simple job and not an engineer. Um, and then you mentioned something very interesting. He used to consult there at a Russian population nursing home in Lincoln. Uh, the ones that I could, they, they, re, they rewrote the menus and recipes into Russian uh, so that the Russian employees not fluent in English could read the information and improve their written English. Um, LPN was from Russia, and there's a couple of nursing assistants from Russia. Um, and they would complain about the toilet paper being left out. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, Americans complaining about toilet paper. These people said we were from places where we didn't have bandages, so that was, but it's something to remember the large number of Europeans that are in the uh, Bosnians, uh, Serbians, um, Russians, you know, quite a few Russians over there uh, as a refugee, both at the university as professors and also as refugees or immigrants, let's say it that way, come before. Um, so that's something that, uh, as I read through this, uh, a lot of your responses, um, were predictable. I mean, they're a lot of logical and that's why, you know, your empathy for the sisters and other people. I'm doing a podcast. Um, so, um, Becky, you mentioned that, uh, at the time of 9-11, you were fearful of people from the Middle East or that that had, you know, you didn't understand what had happened. And so I'll, uh, I'll be doing, uh, you know, I was thinking about that moment in time where 9-11 that impacted a lot of people like Pearl Harbor did another two generations ago, or my generation, when I was 10 years old and Kennedy was assassinated. And I remember, I, I can tell you things from that. I actually watched on TV when the assassin of Kennedy was himself murdered in Dallas in the basement of a, it's hard to believe that some guy with a gun just got loose and walked in there and shot and killed the guy that can't kill Kennedy. Uh, so that made a lot of people believe in conspiracy because if the assassins assassinated too quickly, then you, you don't think it's just a chance. Um, that colored American belief about conspiracy and big government being out to, to manipulate things. Uh, but it would be interesting. Um, I remember at the time of 9-11, bizarre stories going around Lexington. Uh, people were telling me stuff that couldn't possibly be true and swore up and down it was true. They said they, they had arrested some Arabic guy in a car and keeping him in the jail. A jailer told me this, right? And so I was thinking, I said, yeah, but, and then people said there were um, suspicious characters with prayer rugs out by Burger King. I mean, people believe this stuff. It was shocking, you know, how people believe anything now. But at that time I said, you know, you're just out of your mind. There's not people trying to get a plane so they can bomb Lexington, you know, but it was just fear, out of control. If anybody even spoke Arabic, it might be turned into police. And that was very common. On airplanes, people speaking Arabic would be accused of being uh, terrorists and uh, they would be pulled aside. Um, we still have the ramifications and the echoes of that now. So don't be surprised. Some of these terrible things that happen. Um, Another one, uh, Kimberly mentioned um, about the story of the Jehovah Witness. And I remember reading about that. They had to have a purple triangle to show they were religious outcasts and they were also in the concentration camp. Jews had the, the uh, Star of David, yellow. Um, pink triangle was people that were gay. 
green, I think, triangle with political, uh, polit political dissidents. Um, so I just want to mention that. Um, Annika, you mentioned this thing about your feelings about you, uh, Zena to the mother and how lonely she was. She didn't have anybody to talk to. She, her only importance was back in, in uh, Islamabad, um, which it was a tough place, but still was in Pakistan was a place she at least felt some comfort. And, but Annika, you're, you're talking about, you know, the loneliness. When you're the first generation, you give up your whole world and you're over here. And that's very difficult. The young, supposedly the younger you are, the better it is. But I think a lot of it depends on you, you know. And I always see the, there's a big struggle. And this is with the language loss. If the parents do not speak English well and are unable to understand everything going on, their children adapt to speak English. And everything kind of gets tipped upside down. The parents are kind of in the dark and, and the kids know what's going on. It's another reason why you don't have children translate for parents because uh, unless the children are in high school, uh, they're liable not to translate accurately and it's very stressful for them because they don't understand. You can't expect a fourth grader to explain why somebody's failing an eighth grade science class. You know, um, it's when people just think language is, well, whatever, if you speak Spanish, you all speak Spanish. No, maturity matters. Um, another one from, uh, you commented to Lisa, and I thought that was a very interesting thing you could study. Annika made this comment to Lisa. Uh, in my culture, people get together for coffee at a cafe a lot. We call it fika, and it's in between meals, between breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I guess it could be any between times. People invite friends over, instead of a dinner, they meet at the cafe and they have coffee or tea or something like a sweet. People have baked goods in their freezer ready to go in the case someone comes over and you have a fika in your house. So everybody's ready to have a little, I would call donuts, but I'm sure it's different in Sweden. Um, so this is different. And then I remember writing on my notes for this, which I misplaced is siesta, brunch. All of these have different cultural concepts. You don't normally invite people for brunch, maybe a friend or something, but it's not like it's brunch as a gathering of people. It's usually a early, a late Sunday morning, you don't want breakfast, but you don't want lunch or you want both and you have a brunch. Um, going to meet people for coffee. Coffee wasn't as big a deal. You know, I, I know in rural areas, people go to the old co-op and have a cup of coffee that's been boiling on the stove all day. That's not coffee, by the way. By the way, my father used to make coffee. He'd throw the coffee in a pan, boil it. No filter, no percolator, not even that stuff. Percolators are bad because they just throw the coffee over the coffee and you just get this acid. But he'd boil it like 1940, you know. And he would drink it with the grounds in it, which that was pretty depressing to me. Want some coffee? I said, no, that's okay. I'll just go ahead and ruin the drain with it. But all these terms for breaks or for getting together or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, I, I wrote down some of these. I know siesta in, in, or the late, the late supper in Europe. A lot of people eat late supper at night, depending on the culture. I know Latin America. Uh, some places breakfast is in Nebraska. Breakfast was a big deal for farmers. You had to have a big breakfast before you go to work. I do know that some of the farmers in Northeast Nebraska not only had, they had, they ate all the time. I think that was a problem, but they would have a big breakfast. They would go out and work and then somebody would bring them something in the field with a, with a donut or something. They'd have that but while they're working. Then they come in for a big lunch, and once lunch was over, they would work until five, and then they would have supper, and we called it supper, supper, not dinner. I know there's a difference in English. 
depending on where you are. Uh, and then late at night, this is Nebraskans, they would play cards and they'd have malts and popcorn or something like about nine o'clock at night. So it added up to eight, six times a day, which isn't good for your figure, by the way. But that's how I was told that my wife's family who were German descent up in Northeast Nebraska. That's how they farmed for the first half of the 20th century. Um, so they'd, they'd eat a lot and they'd eat a lot of dairy and a lot of meat and a lot of uh, snacks and a lot of sweet donut cake. So anyhow, but I just thought it'd be interesting if you, if you were talking about intercultural, uh, cross-cultural uh, investigation to study how people eat in between meals and what do they eat, uh, Czech food. Uh, what do they call the Czech food? Uh, I forgot now. Some kind of a tart or something. Uh, but they they have in, in the Polish individuals up in Loop City, um, the Czech, the Swedes, the Danes over in Donenburg, Donenburg, whatever. Um, so Nebraska has an excellent, if you're in Nebraska, has an excellent um background to find out about this kind of stuff you know like the fika i wonder if that's still practice in parts of nebraska i know that uh holdridge nebraska and oakland nebraska have swedish populations so occasionally you see the swedish flag and everything and they have but it gets further and further away from swedish every every 10 years you know but sometimes they invite people i know they have people from ireland go to o'neill and they have uh March, I started to say March Madness, but I guess it would be March 17th. Um, okay, Andy had a couple here about the Lost Boys. Uh, if you had them in your class, you'd try to explore everything you could explore with them about their background. You know, I think if people knew the background of our Somali and other students, they would, they, they would know so much more and be more empathetic about what they've gone through. I had several things from Mandy here. She also talked to Maddie. Um, you have you, you have a social emotional curriculum we call second step. Big part of it is stop, name your feeling, and calm down. So you talk about not being able to control things. Sometimes you get in a bad mood. And that's an interesting uh, thing to mention. I, I think of it with English second language students. Uh, some cultures, you don't talk about what's bothering you. It'd be interesting to explore the psychology of different cultures. Um, but that that's something, Andy, you mentioned in replying to Maddie that's interesting to me. And then you were talking to Taylor. Uh, one of the vocabulary words in the article was advocate. A young girl started an organization with other children with limb disabilities could do the same thing. We read the definition of advocate and then discussed what, how you could be an advocate. This is an area that really interests me. Being an advocate for people, it can be, I happen to do ESL, but could be anything, any group, uh, advocate for girls uh, going into math and science. The thing last night about in Congress, how incredibly sexist it is men going up to a new congresswoman congressman and saying hi beautiful hi gorgeous i mean talking to a congresswoman woman that way or treating them like they must be staff because women wouldn't be around them unless they were just secretaries or something which really upset them um i know i had a situation years ago a colleague saw a hispanic person in the building and went up to him and asked him if they were there to fix the furnace. And the guy got very angry because he was wearing a suit and he was here as an educational person, official or something. He was not here to be the janitor. And I just could not believe somebody could be that dumb. I mean, I don't just go up to people that show up and say, are you here to work on my car? Uh, you can bring my order from Jimmy John's. I mean, 
<laughs> um, okay, let's see if there's anything else I want to comment on. Um, anyhow, I hope I appreciate you that you appreciate this book and you're getting something out of it. Uh, oh, Josie, I had something from Josie. Did I mention this? Uh, oh, yeah. You have an aunt who teaches, who taught ESL to adults, and you're planning on talking to her. I'd really like to hear a little report. You could do it on video, or you could just type out something. Not nothing too long. I don't want a big assignment, but just talking about your aunt's experience, Josie, with teaching, and said that uh, you remember, you remember Vietnamese candy. I've never had Vietnamese candy. By the way, Lincoln has a lot of shops, all kinds of international foods, very international cities. So I commend you. Uh, take advantage of that if you're ever there. I've eaten some of it, and some of it's too damn hot for me to tolerate. Uh, a lot of uh, Southeast Asian places, Thai and, oh gosh, obviously Chinese, and Japanese restaurants and everything. Well, thank you very much. I hope this isn't too long, but I wanted to let you know that I appreciate your discussions and I read them very carefully. <laughs>